the secret sauce, if there is one beyond good fortune, I think is grit. Hello, and welcome to another episode of Never Go Against the Family. We're coming to you live from the University of Northern Iowa Family Business Center in Cedar Falls, Iowa. We follow family businesses and topics that help your family business sustain itself. Today, you're getting a sneak peek into the 2024 Iowa Family Business Conference. Dan Binken interviews keynote speaker Kevin Hancock, who is the leader of Hancock Lumber, a sixth-generation family business in Maine. During the conversation, you'll get a taste of Kevin's ethos, so you can be ready with all of your burning questions at the conference on November 6. Keep listening for more. You've had some things happen in your life uh, that have really shaped um, who you've become as a leader, probably not only of your family, but also of your family business and, you know, and that kind of thing. And so could you kind of walk us through that real quick and 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 give us an idea of how you've come to become, you know, frankly, a pretty recognized speaker, actually. So please, Kevin, we'd love to hear that. Yeah, so two big events came tumbling into my life as big events do, neither of which I saw coming. Back in uh, 2010, at the peak of the national housing and mortgage market collapse, I Mm -hmm. quite suddenly um, began to have trouble speaking, and I ended up acquiring a, a rare neurological voice disorder called spasmodic dysphonia that I was told was incurable. I somehow uh, largely cured it, but at the time, I really couldn't talk very much. There's no way I would have been on this podcast with you because I literally couldn't do it. Really? Okay. So I was trying to help run our help lead our company through the collapse of the housing market without being able to use my voice. And quite quickly, I had to come up with a new approach to leadership. And I've become fond of saying when it's hard to, when it's hard to talk, you quickly um, develop strategies for doing less of it. And mine was to answer a question with a question, thereby putting the responsibility for speaking right back on the other person. So you picture this angel scene at work, Dan, someone comes up to me with a question or a problem because I'm the boss or the owner or the CEO. And prior to my voice condition, I would have given an answer or an instruction. And now I started saying just because of my voice, something like, that's a good question. What do you think we should do about it? And what struck me over time asking that question hundreds of times because of my own voice limitations was that people actually already knew what to do. They almost never actually needed a top-down management-led directive. What they really needed was the encouragement to follow their own voice. So that was event number one that got me thinking differently about leadership. And then two years after that, in 2012, somewhat serendipitously, I began traveling from Maine all the way out past you to the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation in the southwest oh. corner of South Dakota. Yeah. Were you mule deer hunting? Uh, what were you place, doing? Uh, no, I was actually going to the res to see what life was like for the people who lived there. I've now been there 30 times and I'm actually headed there Monday. Oh, wow. uh, Pine, so Pine Ridge is home to the Oglala Sioux tribe and they're the direct descendants of some of the most famous war chiefs and medicine men and American history. Names like Red Cloud, Crazy Horse, Black Elk, and uh, others. Okay, okay. And today, it's statistically the poorest place in America. I've had friends there who have descri- described 
their community's journey through modern American history as from first to worst. At Pine Ridge, for me, I the connection is I met an entire community that felt as if it had lost its voice, that didn't feel authentically heard. Okay. So putting my own voice experience together with my time at Pine Ridge, I um, had a, a just a bit of a transformative experience in terms of how I thought about leadership and how I thought about work and its highest purpose and calling. And I concluded that it was to give uh, that leadership, great modern leadership was about giving other people a stronger voice helping people come into their voice, to self-actualize, to realize their worth and power. And then organizationally, I said to myself, well, within a business, if everybody led, wouldn't that company be more effective, dynamic, responsive, agile, and successful than the traditional model where just a few people held all the cards and make all the, made all the decisions. So that set me down a what's now been a 12 or 13 year path of what I talk about at shared leadership, but the idea of dispersing power, giving everybody in the company a voice and, mm -hmm. and inviting everybody in the company to lean in further and harder and really help lead the organization in a way that, makes work more meaningful for the people who do it and produces better performing companies. I can and that's what I'm going to talk about when I have the honor of coming out and being with you all in early November. Okay. All right. This is cool. So, um, yeah, because I, I think, you know, I have a lot of questions, of course, about how does that manifest itself? It sounds theoretically dynamite, of course. You're now creating, you're enabling others, you're creating, um, you know, hopefully more passionate employees who see that uh, my decisions matter, my voice matters, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you know, becoming more active in their, in their abilities of, of what work is. Um, how did you find out how did you trip upon Pine Ridge, South Dakota? How about just we go there to start with and, and see where that goes? Yeah, so I had my voice condition, which was a really traumatic event for me at the time. And it it became the fact that I literally had trouble speaking became symbolic to me around a kind of a deeper internal search for my own authentic voice you know as as your your members know being a, a prominent leader of a family business in a management leadership role you have a lot of roles you play there for others in the family others in the company others in the community and I think it's possible to lose track of the essence of who you actually are, stripped of all those roles. Yeah, okay. okay. And so it became a bit of a spiritual journey for me to kind of find and release my own voice in ways that were bigger than and different than just my role within the family business. And anyway, I always had a love affair with the American West, hiking, hunting, uh, vacationing, and I'm also a bit of a history buff, and I was particularly interested in the second half of the 19th century when our nation's manifest destiny ran into the Plains Indian tribes, and I was reading and reading about that period, and it fascinated me, and then in the summer of 2012, I picked up a copy of National Geographic, and the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation was the cover story, and I read it, 
and I had been in the mode of, of listening to the voice of my heart, not just my head. What do I want to do versus what should I do or what do others expect me to do? And I read that article and said to my wife, Allison, I'm going to go there. I said, I want to see what life is like for the people who live there. And that at the time was just a one-off trip. Okay. But then I went back and then I went again and I'm, when I go next week, it's going to be my 30th visit. And I've written a book about my experiences there. And it's just a place that, um, that really spoke to me. And that's one of the other messages I'm, I'm hoping to share with your community is that, is that in order for us as family business leaders to take care of others, we first got to fill our own cups. Okay. We've got to, we've got to listen to our own voice and make sure we're the healthiest, happiest, alivest version of ourselves that we can be. And I think in, as a family business leader in my own career, I know at times I got lost in my roles and responsibilities to others, all of which I loved, but I know in a way they consumed me and I wasn't, I was listening to everybody but myself in terms of really wanting to be myself, have my own voice and live my own life within the context of also being a good steward and leader of the family business. Okay. And I don't want to take up too much of your time here. Um, you said a couple things there that spoke to me, first of all, what I should, you know, you, I'm assuming prior to 2010, you were thinking with your mind, what should I be doing? What do others think I should be doing? You know, family, employees, whoever, customers, et cetera, right? And then somehow you got yourself transitioned to what do I want to do? What is it that I, in my heart here as Kevin, not as sixth gen Hancock family member, want to do? How do you, I mean, that's a, how did, how did you even get there? Because that just seems very, uh, would you have gotten there without without your voice problems? Do you think? Uh, let me let me know what your thoughts are on that. Yeah, I would. I don't think I would have. I was just busy in the hamster wheel of living and raising a family and running a company, and then and I came in time to see my voice condition as a blessing, an invitation, a blessing, and a and a gift it, out of the, the hardship of it came a transformation for me that I'm so thankful for and ended up making me a, a much more effective leader. So this was the counterintuitive thing I experienced, the more I listened to my own voice, the more I served myself, the more I spoke my own truth, the more I strengthened myself, the more valuable I was becoming to others, not less valuable. I mean, we're all taught this ethos, which on one level is true and good and noble about sacrifice and giving to others and caring yeah. for others. And yeah. of course, as family business leaders, we're going to do a lot of that. This thought that we're exploring right now, though, is really about the best way to do that for the maximum amount of time with the greatest positive force is to first let your own voice free and make sure you're you're living your authentic truth and only then i think do you really have the the deep power to help others do the same i can see that i mean if you have if that deep internal part of you is you know good 
<laughs> but what if it's like, you know, what if you travel down that road and it becomes very selfish or self-absorbed or self-serving? I mean, there's also some parts of it. So it must be that, you know, getting there implies that you've gotten beyond those things or or you've not gotten there far enough, maybe. Um, but anyway, I'm just thinking about that for myself. Like, what if that goes horribly wrong? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And anyway, so a lot of that's kind of, you, you know, spiritual soul searching. And then a lot yeah. of what I want to talk about is really grounded. I'm, I'm going to bring with me in my talk some some data and truth from Gallup, the, the polling company. And um, and they probably know more about the workplace experience on earth than any organization on earth. Yeah. And it's interesting in their last global workplace survey, Dan, here's what they point out. Number one, the first key to corporate success is customer engagement. Okay, okay. Customers that are really into your company. So then what's the key to customer engagement? It's employee that. engagement. Okay. It's employees who are really into your company. It can't just be about the product or the service itself. It has to be the delivery. Correct. So in my uh, in my talk, I'm going to take on the the traditional thought that the customer comes first. To use a piece of main slang, what I like to say now, Dan, is that the customer comes a wicked close second. So at Hancock Lumber, we're really into our customers, really into them. But they, if you make us split airs, they don't come first. The people that work at our company come first. Yep. And our mission has become making work meaningful for the people within our company who do it. We want work to be energy giving, not energy draining. We want work to be filling their cups, yep. not just the owner's cups. And I'm not just talking about money. I'm talking about the vibrancy of life. And, and yep. we've become convinced that if our employees are thriving at work, like Gallup knows that our customers are gonna be thriving that the company is going to be soaring and that the work of leadership gets lighter. And so everybody wins. The owners win, the executives win, the customer wins, the company wins all by focusing on helping make work meaningful, which is really about pursuing elite level human engagement at work. So we we run really close to 90% engagement at our company over across 18 sites and 730 people. Gallup will tell you that the national average right now is about 33%. So about one out of three American workers will describe their work experience as meaningful or engaging. Okay. And what I want to talk about when I come visit is a pathway to performing at triple almost the national average, yeah. which is 90% engagement and the benefits of pursuing that path and the simplicity of pursuing it. The simplicity of pursuing it will be interesting to hear about, I have a feeling, um, because it sounds all these things, you know, when I hear them or read about them, they sound great. But the actuality or the day to day mess of life or stipulations or whatever policies and procedures that we put up, you know, get in the way of of things that what you just said sounds like a utopian society, frankly. And uh, yeah, but I, you know, I think what I'm excited about is I was, it's not just something I've thought about or written about, like I've had the opportunity to do yeah. it. And I'm really excited to come to 
Iowa, having been there before, is it's an incredible state with incredible people in it. And even though maybe on a drive through Iowa, I'm looking at corn versus trees in Maine, yeah. it's really similar. And, and you know, we're a lumber company. So we're, I'm, I'm talking about something that's very not utopian. These are real live blue collar jobs by the hundreds yeah. that we're um, believing we can make consistently meaningful for the people who are doing them in a practical, functional, real world way. And still be profitable and all that. I think and be more is, profitable. Which is, you know, it 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 makes sense theoretically, but it sounds it sounds, you know, I'm sure it isn't easy. And you've had 20 some years to to do it. And so uh maybe we'll end with this, Kevin. Like as far as when you took over as CEO, I think you told me briefly there it was right, you know, like around 2004 something like that 2002 somewhere in that range does the what parts of the company look the most different now or how how does it how does it look different now what are the you know a couple of the biggest things there yeah the biggest thing that's different now from say a quarter of a century ago is the stress has largely dissipated. We were just scrambling all the time in our past life. We were always late, always behind, always catching up. It was always tense. We were always sweating. People were visibly in a hurry. And if you walk through one of our organizations today, our one of our sites today, our total revenues probably more than 10 times what it was then. And you won't find anybody who looks like they're in a hurry. Okay. Okay. You won't find anybody that looks like they're visibly stressed. So their emotions have moved the dial considerably. We, yeah. The work has jet. We found a way to make work energy giving not energy draining like we've we've convinced ourselves that peak performance requires suffering and i've really committed myself to because i've seen it to taking on that assumption okay that, that being a market leader being dominant in your industry or in your market does not require suffering it doesn't require a high level of stress we tend to associate the two together but i'm really yeah. interested in decorrelating them yeah it usually means i have to give up something right i have to sacrifice in order to get there type of thing and right those sacrifices are usually positive things like happiness or <laughs> um uh right you know whatever is calm and free time, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Awesome. This is a great preview for us, Kevin. Um, anything else you think maybe you just want to share with our families before the conference coming up here, anything else you'd, you'd mention to them? Just a big thank you. I'm really looking forward to coming and being with you, with you all sharing ideas, listening, learning, collaborating. I'm excited. I'm All looking right. forward to it. We are too, Kevin. We appreciate it so much. Thanks for your time here. And um, we look forward to having you here uh, with us November 6th. So thank you. Thanks for listening to this episode of Never Go Against the Family, a podcast produced by the University of Northern Iowa Family Business Center. You can find more information about the center, membership, and upcoming events at unifamilybusinesscenter.com. As Vito Corleone advises, never go against the family.